try and be punctual so let's come to God in prayer almighty God and loving and gracious heavenly father and we praise and thank thee again for this time away from the things of the world to come into your house and again to to come to you in prayer father we do praise and thank thee that we have a way to come to you that we have access to the throne of grace we remember again that that veil in the temple was rent in two and we now have free access through the work of our saviour father help us to realize what a privilege this is help us as we come later to prayer uh, to bring all our needs all our desires all our uh, pleasures and blessings to you because we know that you are a gracious god and you are pleased to hear our prayers and you are pleased to grant answers according to your will Help us now as we open your word, as we sing your praises. May it be a time when the Spirit is present amongst us, that our hearts may be warmed and encouraged by what we see and what we understand as you speak to us this evening. So hear these our prayers, we pray, for we ask them in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Right, well, let's uh, continue now in singing hymn number 395. Hymn 395, here from the world we come, Jesus to seek, here may his loving voice tenderly speak. Hymn 395. turn for our scripture reading this evening to the first book of Samuel and chapter 8. First book of Samuel and chapter 8. And we'll start to read at the first verse. Uh, 
Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore, hear their voice. Whoever you shall solemnly forewarn them, and show them the behaviour of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behaviour of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties will set some to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants, and he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man would go to his city. Amen. May God add his own blessing to that reading of his own precious word. And in a minute, I'll make clear why we've read that passage. So we come again to the judges. And we've often opened our talks uh, with this particular verse, the last verse of the chapter of Judges last chapter of Judges in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes in those days there was no king of Israel now I've often mentioned this verse and, and perhaps mistakenly given the impression that this was a bad thing this was a bad there was no king and I think I've said from time there was no authority there was no proper government there was no nothing but, of course, we have to ask the question, why was this the case? Why was there, at that time, no king in Israel? Anyone want to venture? The nation was still a theocracy, yes. The events in Judges, of course, predate the anointing of the first king of Israel, which was King Saul. And at this stage, as we've said, Israel was still a theocracy. God was the highest authority in the nation. So that sets the scene. We look at now perhaps kings versus judges, kings of Israel versus the judges. 
there were, we've considered that there are 12 judges out there appointed by God and they ruled over Israel for around 400 years from beginning to end, including uh, Samson and probably up to the beginning of Samuel. There were, and this is an important point, there were recorded no bad judges during this time. Now we've just read uh, that Samuel appointed his two sons who were supposedly judges, but they don't feature in the list of judges in the book of Judges. So we look at the 12 judges that we've been looking at. And of these, there were no bad judges. And what we've noticed as we've gone through is that the judges have kept the people in obedience to God, and God has prospered the nation and delivered them from their enemies. So in this way, the judges were part of God's blessing on the nation. Only in the periods between the individual judges did the people fall away when they were left to their own devices. And what we don't know is how long these periods were. So if we look at the judges, and we're going to continue on in the next few sessions, we look now at uh, this thought as we've summarised it here. Contrary then to the impression that the time of judges was principally a time of judgement and discipline, the years of judges were marked by deliverance, prosperity and peace. Often it says, doesn't it, and the land had peace. Uh, the years of the judges were marked by deliverance, prosperity and peace as the people returned to the worship of the one true God, Jehovah, or as it says in the scriptures, Yahweh. So, looking then at the kings, as we move into the book of Samuel, following Judges, we find, of course, the appointment of the first king, Saul, and these are the three main kings up until the time the nation is divided. Saul was a particularly good king, led the people astray, disobeyed God, and the spirit was taken from him and given to David. David, of course, as we know, was the great king in Israel, and his son Solomon, uh, the beginning followed perhaps in his father's footsteps but was led away by foreign women and foreign gods and uh, generally led the people away from serving God. So as a punishment, the nation was divided. So the kingdom is split and we find that up until the time of the exile, there were 20 kings of Judah, of which only five, the Bible records, were good kings and 20 kings of Israel, and we don't really find a record of any of those being particularly good or pleasing God or being of great benefit to the tribes in Israel, the northern kingdoms, the 10 northern kingdoms. So kings of the Davidic line from David, because Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, from the uh, father was Kish, uh, from the Davidic line, uh, they ruled for approximately up to 200 years, which is just half uh, the time that the judges ruled. They ruled up to the exile, and these kings in the main led the people away from God, and they were led into idolatry, which of course was ultimately punished in the exile. exile sorry. So, we come just to look at them, and we've looked at Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah last time, and we've looked at all the other small ones. After we've considered Gideon, there will be Jephthah, and then there will be Samson himself. So as you can see there, the um, narrative concerning Gideon stretches over three chapters, chapters 6, 7, 8 of Judges. And Gideon was the judge over Israel for 40 years. And again, if we go back to the kings, there are very few kings that actually ruled for that length of time, David being the obvious exception. But many of them were three years, five years, ten, perhaps even thirty years. Uh, but their bad effect wasn't in that sense around as long as the good effect of the judges. So, let's have a look now. Again, remind ourselves of these two maps. And we're going to be looking at Gideon, and you can see that he's operating 
uh, towards the north, just a bit there below Deborah, and um, uh, to his um, left, uh, right there, we'll see Jephthah as well. So this was uh, Gideon, and he comes upon the scene as we shall see. So chapter 6, and if you want to turn to Judges chapter 6, we're going to look through the chapter a little bit at a time as we see. Sorry, Judges chapter 6. Here we go. So here we have the familiar opening of the chapter. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was. Whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And then they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For well, they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Here we have this oppression lasting seven years it, and it's severe oppression, isn't it? Uh, the food was taken, the animals were taken, their means of uh, living, uh, their means of support, all were taken by the Midianites. And the people cried out to God yet again. Verse 7. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord uh, because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel. The people cried out to God again. They'd had enough. They need to go back. Now, of course, these are not the same people, same generations as we've looked in, uh, in previous uh, judges because... Uh, some reigned for many, many years and the people there would die and their children and probably were looking to a separate generation here or part of a separate generation. And the people cried out to God again. So, who were the Midianites? Here's a little bit of uh, information if I go off a tangent. Who were the Midianites? Well, they were descendants of Midian, who, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, is a son of Abraham by his concubine Keturah. And we find that in Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, the further sons and daughters of Abraham are listed there. Where did they live? Well, it's on the map there, but just to clarify, today we can't, in fact, define the boundaries of the land of Midian. It included territory on the west as well as on the east of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the gulf down where Midian is. Uh, it's the scene of much uh, terrorist activity now. I understand Somalia and those sort of things are going on there. It lay between Edom and Paran, uh, that's Old Testament uh, areas. And in the time of the judges, it seems their district seemed to have extended northward to the east of Gilead. So what we can see is they had to make quite a long journey to come and harass uh, the people of Israel. You can see Jerusalem there and Jericho um, up there to the north of the map there. And they came, it seems, once every year at the time of the harvest, and they destroyed everything. So, we come to chapter 6, and what we've just read is that God sent a prophet to them. He sends a prophet this time, and not a deliverer, not a military man. God's taking a different approach this time why does he send a prophet when they need they need a deliverer why does he send a preacher well we learn five important truths or five applications if you like them 
in this sense one and the same thing from this chapter and I could do no more better than uh, copy Mr Dale Ralph Davis and share his thoughts with you you see first of all we see a word in this chapter a word that criticizes we'll come to that and then there's a word of the grace that holds us and then he says there is the promise that equips us then the demand uh, that commits us and then finally the assurance uh, that settles us now let's go through uh, these uh, thoughts these applications that our good friend mr ralph davis comes up with in his little book judges and he subtitles it so great salvation some very wonderful thoughts in there that bring out perhaps some things that we don't often think about as we perhaps look at these chapters as just a record of events but there is contained in this chapter some wonderful uh, bible teaching and also some gospel teaching as well some things that we learn about ourselves in the examples given to us uh, by using the people of israel as an example so the word that criticizes we're told the prophet went to the people and the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them thus says the Lord God of Israel I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land also I said to you I am the Lord your God do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but you have not obeyed me so here it is first of all the prophet reminds them of god's grace up to verse the second half of verse 8 there he recounts all the good things that he has done and uh, perhaps they have thrown all this back in god's face but you have not obeyed my voice this is in many ways typical of human nature you know if, if I could just take you back perhaps some of you won't remember Christmas Day message we gave that example at the end of the uh, message about the present a valuable present given and then trashed and thrown back in disgust if you like and this is how an example if you like or a picture of what the people had done all the blessings all the goodness that god had showed upon showered upon them was thrown back if you like discarded in their disobedience uh, to god they would have none of it and we shall see their ingratitude as we work through the passage but the prophet here reminds them of all these good things and he goes on later to repeat God's demand if you look in verse 10 um, I am the Lord your God do not fear the gods of, Am of the Amorites in whose land you dwell he reminds them he levels God's accusation at them but you have not obeyed my voice and then the prophet teaches them they need to understand why they were oppressed why they are oppressed as the uh, oppression continues actively through the Midianites they need to understand why they are oppressed and he teaches them that it is God that has given them into the hand of the Midianites because of their disobedience and of course these are thoughts that are, are so applicable aren't they to today's society we live in the West particularly in an affluent society we have every latest mod con uh, we have in comparison to other parts of the world abundant supplies of food and comfort and we are able to travel in our cars and, and afford all sorts of things that make our life easier we also have particularly in the west the freedom to preach and teach the gospel and on the other side of that coin we have the freedom to go and hear and to come into churches and to hear the word of God preached and we also have perhaps that overriding great blessing 
of the ability to come and know Almighty God and the Saviour in a personal, experiential way, don't we? These are the blessings that are bestowed upon us. And so if we reject these blessings, if we take no notice of these things, if we try and want to airbrush God out of society, out of our individual lives, then for sure God is going to bring judgment. And indeed, perhaps in many ways, we see that judgment today in a broken society. We see marriages falling apart, relationships. Jenny and I, of course, as you well know, we've seen all the um, problems that cause through uh, Claire and her partner splitting up and the effect on the children. And I know it's repeated time after time after time. If you go and talk to parents at the school gate, you'll find of all the broken situations all the problems in society, there are problems in society through overindulgence in drugs and alcohol and all sorts of other things. And in many ways, although we don't see the hand of God actually visiting violence upon us, what we do see is God visiting um, situations where there is no peace, where there is unrest, where there is discontent. All these things seek to bring us, uh, in many ways, to the position almost of desperation if we begin to think seriously about it. So these are the thoughts that God is having the prophet pass on to the people before they come to understand their, why they're in the situation they're in. Now what we would think at this stage is that perhaps having said you have not obeyed my voice, the prophet would go on to proclaim the coming judgment. But of course, these people are already being judged in the oppression that comes upon them. You see, what we can summarise from here is that one of the kindest things that God does for us is to bring us under the criticism of his word, to expose the reasons for our helplessness and misery. And he does this through the preaching, through the counsel and the, min the reading, of the word of God and again that's a quote from Dale Ralph Davis he seems to be able to grasp uh, these things in an overall sense look at the big picture and, uh, and that's a word isn't it that's a thought a, a sentiment there that's echoed throughout the centuries and is really applicable today perhaps for us as Christians we understand the kindness of God through the operation of those things in our own personal lives. So, we move on to the grace uh, that holds us. As I've just said, following the criticism, but you have not obeyed my voice, we might expect the prophet to announce dire judgment. And again, if you go through the scriptures in many times, in Jeremiah and other of the major prophets, and indeed in the minor prophets, um, if you look at the book of Habakkuk, uh, God predicts that he's sending those awful Assyrians. Judgment is coming on the people for their wickedness. We would expect that type of reaction, we would have expected that type of information to follow directly uh, from the prophet. But the narrative here in the scriptures from verse uh, 11 goes on immediately uh, to teach us about God's moves to raise up a deliverer. The message has been given, the warning has been given, and now God goes on to provide us with information concerning the deliverer. You see again, when he ought to destroy the people because of their gross uh, immorality, because of their disobedience, he is actually going to deliver them yet again, time and time again, through his goodness and his grace and his mercy. He delivers his own people. Describes them, doesn't he, elsewhere in the scripture as the apple of his eye. And so he comes to their rescue yet again. And so we could look at Ephesians chapter 2, just the opening verses there. Ephesians chapter 2, he said that he's teaching them again through the word and you he made alive who were dead the people of Israel were dead in their trespasses and sins 
in much and he's in, Paul is here speaking and God is through the word is speaking to us in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath what a picture of the Israelite and what a picture of unbelievers today but then here we have this thought again but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us Isn't, wasn't this true the people of Israel in those days this great love this great deliverance that comes time after time in the book of Judges here so we move on quickly you see again in Exodus 34 verse 6 we have this verse the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands forgiving the iniquity and the sin and so it goes on a picture here of a gracious God a God who extends his grace uh, to keep us and again Ephesians 2 1 to 3 which we've just looked at uh, but God who is rich in mercy he does deliver sinners he does deliver he does save rebellious people uh, because he has set his love upon him and what he promises uh, all who believe in me shall be saved he has promised them and he will not deny his promises so that's the grace that holds us and again Dale Ralph Davis makes this statement it's very interesting he said could ever anyone when you think about the nature of God and think about the nature of the sinners that God loves so much could anyone have invented a God like this other religions talk in terms only of punishment and good works and the need to impress a God but here we have a God who understands sin who overlooks sin who has provided the guilt and the punishment of that sin to be taken upon himself he said it would be too much for us guilty sane folk to hope for a God who bridles his judgment to hold us in his grace and this is the God who displays himself in the pages of Judges chapter 6 so we come thirdly to the promise that equips us and it's a very simple promise we turn here to verse 12 and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, this is to Gideon, he comes to him while he's threshing wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of earth. Here is the simple promise. The simple, simple promise, Yahweh is with you, the Lord is with you. So, perhaps Gideon... And perhaps even we, if we take comfort from that word, the Lord is with you. Perhaps there were questions that arose of things that we've already read about. If Yahweh was with them, why was Gideon beating out wheat in a wine press? Why wasn't he doing it on a threshing floor, as would be normal? Why is he keeping it secret? Secondly, why did the Midianites attack every year? Where were all the deeds of God, as it was in the days when he delivered the people from Egypt. Mighty things. The ten plagues were used. Tremendous things. Miracles that God brought upon the Egyptians in order that his same people might be delivered. God at this moment wasn't delivering his people. He was putting them in uh, suppression. But the promise is, Yahweh is with you. Why had he abandoned them to the Midianites? Why were the Midianites given free run? over them and then perhaps further objections with this uh, Gideon says here doesn't he but my clan is the weakest tribe in Manasseh he says I'm not a valiant man I'm not a, a man of war and in fact I don't come from a big tribe only a small tribe and indeed I am the youngest in my family what about my elder brothers uh, we remember don't we the Samuel went to anoint a new king it wasn't the elder brothers it wasn't the good-looking ones or the big, powerful, strong ones. It was the weakest, the youngest that God had set. And so God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the strong. And the simple things of this world to confound the wise. 
And so here, again, are the objections of Gideon uh, to the call of the Lord. But God makes this promise, and this promise is the answer, isn't it? To all Gideon's objections, to all his excuses. I am with you. What more did Gideon need? Well, it appears Gideon needs assurance still. He's uh, very doubtful. He's very uh, reluctant in some ways. And again, we have echoes of Moses, don't we? Uh, God had to say to Moses, okay, I'll send someone with you, but don't be worried. When you go before Pharaoh, I will give you the words to speak. So Gideon needs assurance. And what we see here is that there is this test set out. Gideon prepares a morsel of bread and meat and uh, he lays it on the ground and the angel of the Lord uh, touches it with the tip of his staff. And what do we see as a result? We see fire comes up, there comes of Elijah again. Uh, the fire comes up, uh, the food disappears, it's consumed, it disappears. And then the realisation in it sense dawns upon Gideon. Oh no, Lord Yahweh, for I have seen the face of the angel of God. There was another prophet, wasn't there, who said, uh, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a sinful man and dwell in the amongst the people of uh, sinful hearts uh, because he had, been, he had seen uh, the Lord. This realisation dawns upon Gideon and the reality of who it is that's with him uh, dawns upon him and in, in many ways encourages him. And so it is the promise, the Lord is with him. Can we take that promise with us in our day-to-day -day lives? The Lord is is with us in whatever situation we find ourselves we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit the Lord is with us and at times perhaps we think it's difficult to recognize the promise of the Lord but what did the Lord Jesus say as he went back uh, at the end of Matthew lo I am with you I'm with you I will never leave you even to the end of the age, until we are taken from this earth and found with him in the eternal city, New Jerusalem. So this is the promise that equips us. It's a promise, as I say, for us today. The Lord is with us. And then there is the demand, as Mr. Davis says, the demand that commits us. The demand was, as we look down there, verses... 25 to 32 now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him take your father's young bull the second bull of seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the woman in wooden image that is behind it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you so cut down. So Gideon took ten men among his servants and did as the Lord said to him, but because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Here is the demand. And Yahweh was prepared to deliver them. He's almost said that as he says, I am with you, a mighty man of valour. Yahweh was prepared to deliver them but Israel itself must be prepared for such a deliverance. You see, Yahweh's demand essentially is Baal must go. We must clear away from our hearts and minds anything in this world. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, says the Lord. I, the Lord, am the God. You must have no other gods before me. And here it is. Why is it the demand that commits us? Well, as Gideon carried out this demand, as he destroyed the image of Baal and the wooden, wooden image, he's in effect nailing his colours to the mast. It is seen in all Israel uh, that Gideon is for the Lord, that the people of Israel must indeed put away the idols and the worship of Baal in order they might submit themselves to the will of God and to experience 
his deliverance. So Gideon did as God commanded and it caused furore, didn't it? In the city, the men said, whoever's done this should be put to death. But uh, Joash, Gideon's father, comes and defends his son and he challenges the people in the most extraordinary way. In fact, what he's saying, and he does say that, he says, if Baal is a god, is he not able to defend? Do you need, do you need to defend Baal? If he is a god, why do you want to protect him in this way? And so the issue then becomes either continue to prop up Baal or worship at the altar of Yahweh. Here it is, the two, as Moses said to the people in Deuteronomy, choose life. Behold, I set before you life and death. Choose life. That you might live long in the land. And this is what the challenge here is. This is the demand uh, that commits us. And finally, the assurance that settles us. And we read there, don't we, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Again, there's a reference here, and it's the same thing that happens as the Spirit leaves Saul. So it's recorded there in 1 Samuel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. And again, we've seen it with previous studies in the Judges. The Spirit of the Lord came upon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon. And so here we have it. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. But again, you see, briefly, Gideon again seeks assurance from God. But this time, it's on the basis of God's word. Look at verse 34. And, uh, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abbey Rezerites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered. He also sent messages uh, to Asher, Sorry, verse, oh yes, verse 36. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, and then he says this, as you have said, verse 36, as you have said. So he comes to God asking for this assurance based on the promise of God, based on the word of God, as you have said. And in many ways, this is teaching for us also, isn't it? We can come and claim the wonderful many multitude of promises because God has promised and God never denies his promise. God always fulfills his promise and so we have the well-known episode which we take to the children about in Sunday school, the fleece wet and the fleece dry and I don't need to go into great detail about that. And so here we have at the end all the tribes ascending, assembling and they all assemble don't they? in the knowledge uh, that God is with them. They all assemble in the knowledge that God is with them. Uh, Gideon blows the trumpet, and the Abiezrites gather behind him. And he sent messengers through all that. Manasseh who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. The people came to join together under the leadership of Gideon, a man upon whom the Spirit of the Lord had come, and a man who had been assured that God was with them. And so, God is not, in this sense, ashamed to stoop down and reassure us in our fears. God comes down to Gideon. He takes part in the request of the fleece wet and the fleece dry. He took part in the test of the morsel of bread and meat. God is not ashamed to come down and reassure us in our fears. He is, as we see so often in the book of Judges, he is patient. He was patient with the weakness of the people of Israel. He is patient with our weaknesses. God is willing to humble himself to boost our fragile faith. And of course, that finds its true essence in, in the work of the cross. He humbled himself and became obedient to death even the death upon a cross. God is willing to humble himself, to boost, to strengthen our fragile faith. So, what thoughts we have from the book of Judges and the early example of Gideon. As I said earlier, Gideon, the events of Gideon cover chapters 6, 7 and 8 and next time, God willing, we'll look at chapter 7 and chapter, part of chapter 8. May God bless his word to us. Amen.
Well, before we come to prayer, then let's sing together hymn 406. Approach, my soul, the mercy seat where Jesus answers prayer. And there humbly fall before his feet, for none can perish there. 406. Understand that Pat is going back to her own home.